21 to 7, rural news and information on this Tuesday, the 15th day of March. And Jen, the oysters of the Pummiston Passage. I just love this story, Rob. And when I found out about it last week, I was trying to juggle two jobs to, to, to do the mm. research for it. So we have a gentleman, a marine biologist by the name of Dr. Ben Diggles, and he works with um, oyster diseases and farmers across Australia to try to um, improve the health of their oysters. But he actually lives on Bribie Island. So off his own bat, he spent hundreds of hours starting to do this research into the lost reefs of the Pummerstone Passage. And this is something I never knew existed. Apparently, before white settlement, the whole area there was filled with oyster reefs. So when white settlers came, they plundered it virtu- <laughs> virtually Seafood and pulled a feast. lot of it out. So there's just one oyster farm left. And now he's got the funding, thanks to the help of SEQ Catchments, um, the Palmerstone Passage Fish Restocking Association, Moreton Bay Regional Council and Unity Water, yesterday handed over a cheque that's going to make it possible for him to start working on the red tape that will allow him to do this study in the marine park, trying to get oysters back into the system because they act as the lungs of the water. They filter out nutrients and nitrogen, and you can imagine how important that is. Mm. With so much farmland in the catchment, so much development, we've got um, Clounder South Mm -hmm. coming up, Mm -hmm. another Mm -hmm. 50,000 people. So is this for, you know, potentially getting an industry up there so we can buy the locally grown oysters or...? No, No. this is not for human consumption. It's purely for the health of the Pummerstone Passage because... That's interesting. There's so much problems with the health of the waterway Mm. there. Mm. It consistently rates very lowly on the Healthy Waterways report card. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was talking about in the Caboolture River now, there's one zone where there's just no oxygen left. Right. So that's what the oysters so biological do. biological cleaning. Yeah, basically. Wow, scrubbing the water with the oysters. And bring that oxygen back in. That's great. But at the moment, oh, we went to the oyster farm yesterday. It was just covered with algae and sediment. And every time it floods, mm. really Big impacts on the oysters because they need to be out of the water and underwater, sort of. Yeah, the tide so it's, to work, it's a really complex what arrangement. Is it is it sprats or sp- yeah. Is it sprat? I think it is. Or sprag or something. No, no. The tiny little oyster no, baby little that oysters, floats baby around. Sprats. In. Sprats. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's really interesting. And so right. I went out with him yesterday, and after a few technical difficulties, came up with <laughs> this version here. Let's have a listen. Dr. Ben Diggles, this is the last remaining oyster farm in the Pummerstone Passage. This lease and the shellfish racks, um, I understand, are all that remains of what you call the lost reefs of this area. Yes, uh, the oyster industry in Pummerstone Passage was Queensland's probably first and certainly the largest industry in the state for, for a large number of years uh, from colonisation in the early 18. 18- 20s onwards, uh, they actually built a lot of the, uh, uh, the early buildings in Brisbane based on um, using oyster shells, crushed oyster shells for lime to, to build the concrete and things like that. So essentially the, this Brisbane in particular, but the whole state's probably has been built up from that industry, uh, but now we're seeing it as a real shadow of its former self. I understand the situation's pretty dire here in the Palmerstone Passage for this last remaining oyster lease. Um, the gentleman who owns that lease actually has to work as a security guard to, to keep the money coming in. So tell me what the problems have been here. Well, it's been a, a, the decline sort of over the last hundred odd years. There's been issues with uh, this changing environment as, as Brisbane's grown and as uh, the catchment behind the, uh, the estuary has been cleared been a large amount of sediment uh, sort of getting into the area and that tends to smother the original oyster reefs. Uh, The nutrient loading goes up, all the the sewage and and things that goes in and runoff from uh, fertilisers and things. And uh, and oysters are sort of like the canary uh, in the coal mine in that respect because they're they're quite sensitive to some of the changes. Uh, The oyster reefs sort of started disappearing uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, they, they lost them from the deeper water first, the smothering, and there was also a large, the large fishery sort of took its toll uh, in that there was probably some overfishing originally, but essentially the oyster reefs failed to, um, to recover. And then disease came in a bit later as the water quality continued to decline. 
Now you have an ambitious plan for this area. What is that? We're not the first people to come up with this idea, but around the world there's been a large amount of research, uh, especially in the US and now, as I say, in Victoria, to, uh, to restore these shellfish reefs. Because the shellfish scientists have realised that they have these very uh, large m number of ecosystem services they provide to the, to the estuary. They, they filter the water, so they're sort of cleaning the water as they go, as they're feeding. They, uh, they take nitrogen out of the water when they're, uh, when they're doing that. Uh, they sort of link the, the planktonic food chain to the animals that we, we like to eat. So like an oyster reef uh, is a substrate for uh, an area for little crabs and fish to sort of uh, grow and, and hide. And, uh, and so they're sort of the building block of the, the estuary. I call them the, uh, well, the, the kidney or the, the lungs of the estuary. And what we're, we're seeing in other parts of the world is if, uh, if you do good research and uh, a little bit of time and effort finding the right ways, we can get these, uh, restore these oyster reefs and get the lungs of the estuary back working again. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. You've got a bit of red tape to contend with, I understand. Yeah, well, Moreton Bay is a marine park now, and that's one of the, uh, the issues that we're going to have to, uh, to uh, address as we go, go through this process. Uh, uh, essentially, there's also there's a large number of water users. Uh, there's the Department of Transport we have to work with. And, uh, I mean, fisheries are very supportive of us, but there is, uh, we're kicking off this, this process of reef restoration and the red tape side of it's uh, one of the big first steps. It, it'll be interesting, but we're hoping to bring the uh, authorities along with us as we uh, start this journey. So you've got some donations, I understand Unity Water, Moreton Bay Council and local recreational fishers? Yeah, the local fishing club, the Pumastone Passage Fish Stocking Association has had $50,000 uh, for several years actually wanting to do something about the Pumastone Passage, the health of the Pumastone Passage. And uh, this is, we've sort of, uh, they've looked at a few options and this seems to be the, the best approach, the best use of that money. And to their credit, the Moreton Bay Regional Council has put in uh, 20,000, I think, Unity Water 12,000 to try and match that fund so that we can kick off starting to uh, work away at the red tape and do some planning. I imagine this could be quite valuable in terms of negating the fertilisers, they're just saying, that are coming in from farmland. We've got Caloundra South, another 50,000 people coming in with a new city there, all in the catchment. Um, this could be quite valuable uh, to negate the impact they're having on the area. Yeah, well that's certainly one of the things we really want to research is to work out exactly how much nitrogen we can fix with these oysters, how, how much benefit we can provide to the, to the uh, ecosystem in, in getting them back in there. And that's why we're, it's a strong research component to this in, in the hope that we could develop some offset models where we could work with developers to, to try and offset uh, you know, past and definitely future uh, development in the catchment. 14 to 7, isn't that great? It is pretty interesting, isn't it? Ben Diggles. Yes, he was incredible. I just was really impressed by his enthusiasm for it too because he hadn't received he hasn't received any money up till now and he's been doing his own little studies with Besser bricks and bits of oyster trying to get as the reef as the, the Besser brick acting as the reef. Well, so just helping hold down the shells okay. as um Daniel yeah, yeah. just told us spats. Yes, yeah, spats. We got that spats wrong. For spats the for the baby oysters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I also, when I was out there, met Fred Palin, and he's from the Jundaburra people, because there used to be these huge middens the Aborigines feasted on the oysters. So yeah. you can imagine right. these huge piles of shells that were scattered throughout yeah. the Palmerstone Passage, which were where they had all their feasts and. When the white settlers came in, they used a lot of that for road base, so they dug it up and shipped it off. But the Aborigines actually held a lot of the oyster leases for oyster farming up until the sort of 1960s, and then there was a Taylor family that took over. And Fred's auntie was one of the, the last Indigenous women involved with the leases, so he now is trying to get involved. He's very enthusiastic about getting behind this project and hopefully he's hoping to do some education in schools and they've even talked about oyster gardening. Wow. So if you've got the bribey canals, <laughs> you might have a, you know, your rich boat out the back and throw That's down so this, this um, some oysters and yeah. start growing it to filter the water in your That's own so area. So, I love it. so this is Fred Palin. Are you on a boat here? We are. The sound quality is a little dodgy. Sorry, just getting used to the equipment. No, no, we'll go with you. Sound effects, here we go. Basically what happened was that once uh, the last turn, which is my auntie's blood, she, they, uh, they removed the houses and they took the land back for a reserve. But the, the, the leases were 
we're all on the uh, natural reefs and around about the 1970s there was pressure from the DPI that they didn't want any more rock oyster industry, they wanted it all to be uh, racks and so forth. Fred Palin, why does this reef restoration project interest you so much? Well, it, it's basically like Ben said, it, the oyster reefs are the lungs of, the, of an estuary and we're seeing them, uh, them diminish out here now. Better to have a healthier reef that's going to do an ecosystem service, it's going to take nitrogen out of this water and, and we got a lot of nitrogen in here from all the farms, turf farms and from all the, the, the drains that are coming into the passage now. It's really important for the city of Rock Oyster but we don't want to see it just it's very important for uh, Aboriginal people because it's, it's their uh, cultural landscape too. So they, they know what's going on out here and they like to be part of it. Cracking yarn, Jen. Cracking yarn. Thank you very much. Well done. Very, very interesting. The lungs of the Palmerston Passage, hopefully coming soon. We'll see. I would really like that to happen. I mean, the whole idea, the trouble is he's having this struggle because marine parks are trying to keep things the way they are, hmm. not take them back to the way they used to be. So that's, that's, that's what he's point, trying to do, yeah. is actually Go back to get the good those permissions. But like you said, fisheries is, is being very helpful. And Susie Chapman from SEQ Catchments has been working really closely with them. And they have whole networks with the farmland and, and different users of the land around it too. So Good eye. Love it. Great story. Jen Nichols. First story on oh, the ABC. Rob, I think I need a coffee now. You have a, you have a triple <laughs> shot. That was great work. Back tomorrow at the same time. It's 10 to 7.